you join me in turning your, your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, John chapter 15. I think we all can agree that this year has proven to be very challenging. And I think even putting it that way is an understatement. With the chaotic events that have ensued, are ensuing, that show no sign of slowing down, one of the challenges that a lot of people are facing is finding joy and happiness in this time of life. And we as the people of God, as the church, are certainly not exempt from this worldwide tension. Which means that there might be many within the body of Christ, our own congregation here, who find themselves in a similar position, hunting for joy and asking themselves the question, can I be joyful right now? And is there joy for me to cling on to? Which is why I think a timely message is needed to be preached this morning, namely on the subject of joy. The Lord has really gripped my heart and and has led me to preach on this topic. Those who belong to the church ought to be the most joyful people on the planet even if that planet is on fire. But the question is, how are we joyful? Especially in seasons like we're the one we're in right now. Well, today we come across a section of scripture that I pray will transform the way we understand and embrace the virtue of joy. The title of my message, if you're taking notes, is the church's joy. And we're going to key on verses nine through 11 of John chapter 15. Would you read with me those three verses? This is the word of Christ. As he says, just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Father, as we approach your word, we desperately, dependently ask for your help to not just have it accurately cut and divided. But Lord, we ask that as we read and understand your word, we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds that you would help us grasp joy and transform us and conform us to look more like your son as a result of our study in your word together. We love you so much, God, and we pray too that you would be glorified in this time together, both in the public preaching of your word and in our hearts as we receive it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to help us avoid crash landing in this passage. It's been a while since we've been in John. As we've been in the sequential exposition of 1 Peter, we're coming back now because currently we paused in chapter 18 of John. But as we backtrack a little bit, I want to remind you that between John chapter 13 through 18, Scholars and theologians refer to this section of John as Jesus's farewell discourse. Chapters 13 through 18, it covers Jesus's final moments with his disciples as they're celebrating the Passover before his hour that arrives. The hour in which he's to be betrayed by Judas, delivered up to the Jewish and Roman authorities to be crucified. In John chapter 13, Jesus permits Judas to betray him in verse 27. If you turn back a page or two, verse 27 of John chapter 13 says, after the morsel, Satan, that Jesus gave uh, Judas, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Satan entered into Judas 
and Jesus permitted him to betray him. And after Judas leaves, Jesus begins his farewell teaching by telling his disciples that where he goes, they cannot follow him. Speaking of his death, his crucifixion. Fast forward to verse 33 of John chapter 13. We see Jesus saying this little children. I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you where I am going, you cannot come. Then as the narrative progresses in verse 36 of John 13 and in John 14, verse one, we get a window in how the disciples reacted to this bomb that Jesus dropped on them, even though they should have known it was coming. Verse 36 of John 13, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Then fast forward to verse one of John chapter 14. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The disciples were troubled. They were worried, anxious. They were panicking as Jesus, their Lord is going to leave them in the midst of an oncoming tidal wave of oppressors to Christ and any who would claim to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. But in the midst of their worry, Jesus being the good shepherd that he is knows this and continues his teaching into chapter 14 and chapter 15 to make several commandments and link those commandments with promises as a way of strengthening and bolstering his disciples to press on, even in the midst of fear. Specifically, I want to hone in on the commandment he makes in John chapter 15, verse four. Notice verse four of John chapter 15. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. The imperative, the command that he issues is to abide. The word means remain, stay, remain faithful to me. In other words, don't do what Judas just did. Do the opposite of what Judas just did. Remain, stay, obey. And the analogy that he gives in John chapter 15 is a helpful one to paint a picture of, of what this abiding ought to look like, like a branch attached to a vine. So Jesus being the vine, his disciples being the branches, they are to latch on and not let go of Christ, regardless of what they're going through. As he continues in this teaching, the commandment he gives is connected to several promises that he makes. The first promise we see in verse five of John chapter 15 is that Jesus will abide in them if his disciples abide in him. Another promise he makes in verse five is that they will also bear much fruit. But then he makes a promise a few verses later regarding joy. His joy will abide in them while their joy is made full. If they abide in him and if they remain. So as we find ourselves within this section where Jesus is talking about the joy that is offered to followers of him who abide. I want to bring to your attention four aspects of this joy that we need to give ourselves to this morning. These will serve as our points. Point number one, the substance of the church's joy, the substance of the church's joy. What is it? What is it? Secondly, the source of the church's joy. Where is this joy found? Thirdly, the seas of this joy. How is this joy received and kept? Fourthly, the surrender of this joy. 
How is it lost or forfeited? We're going to look at those in turn. The first is the substance of the church's joy. Notice verse 11, the word joy appears twice. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. The Greek word here for joy is kara. And the word means to be joyful, to be happy, to be glad. What's important to understand about this word is that it has two different usages in the scriptures. And it is the context of that particular passage that helps us determine what use of kara is being applied by the author. Let me break those down for you and give you examples in scripture. Starting with the first use of kara, it is circumstantial joy, circumstantial joy. This is a delight that comes from favorable circumstances that is primarily emotional and feelings based. A good example to see this uh, uh, used is in John chapter 16, verses 16 through 22. If you're not there, would you turn there with me? John chapter 16 should be about a page or so. Notice verse 16 of John chapter 16. This is again, Jesus saying a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will see me. And again, a little while and you will uh, see, uh, see me. And because I go to the father. So they were saying, what is this? He says a little while. We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. In this passage, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the wake of grief that's going to come upon them in the wake of his crucifixion. But Jesus also says that he will come back to his disciples, alluding to his resurrection when he appears to them after his crucifixion. And he says that when he comes back upon his return, the grief of his disciples will turn into joy. They're going to become emotionally ecstatic make an emotional 180 degree turn going from grief and anguish to joy and happiness. What we need to key in on is the word joy here. Kara is circumstantial. It's predicated upon Jesus coming back. Only when Jesus returns, will they be joyful. And it's reinforced through the example that Jesus gives in the text. Verse 21 of John 16 of the woman in labor who's in pain in the moment. But then when the baby comes, her pain turns into joy because of the child being delivered and born. The kind of joy here is a universal joy. This is a joy everybody has. This is both the believers and non-believers joy. An example I like to refer to is along these lines is Disneyland who markets themselves as the happiest place on earth. When you walk through the doors, you're happy. It's, it's fun. The way that they've designed the, the experience, it's every care in your mind you leave at the door but the moment the park closes, the moment that you bring your phone off of airplane mode 
and you, you get the flood of texts and phone calls and you're thrusted back into life again. And you remember how hard life is and how painful life is. Doesn't, doesn't the joy wear off kind of like a painkiller? The, the emotional effects just fade away. That's the kind of joy that's being talked about here. Now, I'm not saying that in the Lord is not saying the word of God is not saying that finding joy in circumstances and places and people is a sinful thing. But what the word of God is saying is that there is a deeper, richer, longer lasting joy that exists. And we see this when we understand the second use of Kara. This second use is a joy that is constant, continual, and transcendent. Going beyond the emotions, going beyond the incident or circumstance. I want to show you an example of this in 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, to the right of your Bible, keeping a finger in John. We were here not too long ago, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. But in light of our study, it is a helpful verse to look at. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. In this passage, the apostle Peter is writing to Christians who are undergoing various trials, as he mentioned earlier in verse six. And although they're suffering a great deal of pain and anguish, they have joy, as Peter puts it, that is inexpressible. Even though they don't see Christ now, they have joy. There's a contentment about them. There's a stability about them. They're anchored even in and through what they are going through. They possess such a delight and satisfaction. They can't even find the words up to describe it. It's just there. This is the joy that doesn't just sit on the surface, but it lives deep down in the heart of the believer. This is the word that Jesus and the usage that Jesus brings before his followers in our passage. This is what is offered. And if you're not uh, back there already, turn back to John 15. As this is what Jesus is referring to here, there's a couple more observations to make in verse 11 regarding the substance of this joy that is referred. And the second observation that needs to be made is the exclusivity of this joy. Jesus says in verse 11 that what he's offering is your joy. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his followers, to believers. This joy is uh, reserved for the saints of God. Non-believers have never received this. They've never experienced this kind of joy. They're baffled. They're scratching their heads when they see a Christian as calm, cool, collected, content in the middle of the rattling storm of their life. They don't understand. Not when everything that is perceivable has been stripped away. This doesn't make sense. It's because this joy is for Christians. For those who trust in Christ. This is a gracious gift that God gives to disciples of Christ. Second, a third observation we need to make is the measure of this joy. Verse 11, Jesus says, your joy will be made full. The Greek word here is, it refers to a maximum amount of something. The joy of the Lord is not only offered out of the abundance of God's goodness and grace, but it is also offered out of the abundance of his generosity. 
This is a generous quantity being described here. An amount of great quantity and large abundance, more than the believer needs, more than enough of this joy is what they have. That leads us to pinpointing, okay, where do we find it? Where is it located? Point number two, the source of the church's joy. Well, again, notice verse 11. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. Jesus is saying that his desire is that is for his disciples to possess the joy that he has. So the source then of our joy comes from Jesus Christ. He's the wellspring of our joy, the origin of our joy. But in helping us understand this a little bit more clearly, Jesus's uh, desire to give us his joy, it's, it's helpful to understand that he is giving us joy that was initially given to him. He's passing on what was given to him. Because even though God is joy, his attribute is joy, just as he is love, that doesn't mean that he can't receive joy or receive love. Jesus receives joy and love, as we'll see in our text, from the Father and passes it on to us. We see here in our passage that Jesus's joy comes from the love that the father has for him. Notice a couple verses back from verse 11, namely verse nine. Look at verse nine. Just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus's pleasure, delight, joy comes from the father's deep perfect, eternal love for his son. And to get a glimpse of that Trinitarian love, author and pastor John MacArthur makes the following point in his book, None Other, which is very helpful. He says, quote, everything the father has, he gave to his son, everything. The father shows the son everything he is doing. And the son does does what he sees the father doing. The generosity of the love of God to the son is that all the father's knowledge, all the father's power, all the father's secrets, all the father's privileges and all the father's honor is given to the son. The father holds nothing back and the son in perfect reciprocal love says that all he has is only what the father has given him. Thus he celebrates the expression of perfect love in consummate generosity that holds nothing back, end quote. The love that the father has for his son is a generous love, a sacrificial love, a love of giving all to Christ, his son. And what Jesus is saying is he is loving us the same way that the father has loved him. And as we were helped by Pastor John MacArthur, we know that the nature of that love is a generous giving love of the will. But what does it mean for Jesus to love us and love his disciples? Well, turn back to John 13, one. And John makes a statement uh, uh, that highlights this love. John chapter 13, verse one. John says, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The love, the generous, sacrificial love that holds nothing back that Jesus poured out upon his followers is laying down his own life for us, giving us his life and not holding back from that. He received that kind of love from the father and he's passing it on to his disciples. 
It's an incredible thought to think that the Trinitarian God, our Trinitarian God, would allow us to be partakers and enter into communion and fellowship of this love and joy. We get a glimpse and a glimmer of this love when we reflect on the cross. But an important connection is about to be made as we now look at the seas of this joy. How do we get a hold of it? Verse 10, Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. The love and thus the joy that Jesus offers is conditional. Contrary to many teaching, it is conditional. It comes at the price of obedience. Does he not say, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. The keeping of Christ's commandments speaks of the submission of the heart, of the mind, of the will to the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks of the turning from sin, the slaying of sin and the surrendering to Christ, the absolute alignment and obedience to the word of God. What he makes clear in verse 10 is that his love and joy abide in those who obey him. Here is the important connection that we need to make this morning with obedience and joy. To obey Christ is to enter into the joy that he offers. And there are a whole host of scriptures that declare the same thing. We seize joy when we are singularly, singularly focused upon God. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, you will make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy in your right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Are we looking for joy? They're in his holy presence. Are we looking for a uh, full joy? You'll only find that in his right hand. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed, happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Give yourself to God. Matthew 11 verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is true. We are at our happiest when we are closest to God. But we also need to heed an important warning as pastor and author Steve Lawson issues when he says the following quote, quote, one of the most infamous lies of the devil is that a life lived that is sold out for the glory of Christ is a miserable life. The Christian life is certainly hard and there's certainly pain involved in the Christian life. Jesus said so himself about the promised persecution, but it is certainly not a life marked by misery or a lack of joy. It is quite the opposite. When we've denied ourselves, when we've taken up our cross in commitment to following Christ, there is maximum joy there for the believer who sells it all and chases after our Lord. But oftentimes obedience gets a bad rap, does it not? And it's grieving to even think about and to even say that in greater evangelicalism, there is a, a rising movement of pastors, of Christians 
who are looking to do away with obedience, to etch that out of our vocabulary and to highlight grace. What really what they're doing is abusing grace to say that you really don't have to worry about keeping the commandments of Christ because there's grace. But the Bible, particularly Paul in Romans six would refute that to say, that's just an abuse of the grace of God to say that you can just not worry or not be concerned with following after Christ in his word. Oftentimes Christians who are God fearing, who are focused on uh, uh, following the commands of Christ are labeled legalistic. They're labeled those who are just over the top in need of some more grace. Christians who just need to cool down. But Jesus explains in our passage how vital the role of obedience is. And he does so by using himself as an example to say, not only must you obey to abide in my love and thus um, enter into the joy that comes from Christ. Jesus is saying in verse 10, the latter part, I do the same thing with the father. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Obedience is marked by Jesus as well in obeying the father. I think what's important in seeing obedience in the role of Jesus's relationship to the father is that Jesus is not saying that he's working to earn the father's love. This isn't a requisite to achieve a, 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 a relationship with the father, but his obedience is a response to the love that the father has given him. Jesus keeping the commandments of his father had a twofold purpose. One, to respond in adoration, to respond in gratitude, to respond in love to the father. Jesus himself says so in John chapter 14, verse 31. But I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. It's a way to reciprocate that love. Secondly, it is to remain plunged into his love for to not obey, to disobey would mean to distance himself from the love of the father. But his obedience kept him plunged into the love of the father. And the same is true in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our obedience to Christ, us doing what the Bible says is not a requisite to achieve the love of God and somehow get it into our lives. It's a response. It's a response to the love that has been freely and graciously shown to us. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is a gospel of grace. It's, it's not a matter of what you have done or what you can do for God. It's a matter of what you couldn't do, which is please God because of your sin and your rebellion. It's a matter of what God has done for you. Even in the midst of your spiritual death, in waywardness. He was the one to initiate. He was the one to send his son and to make a way of salvation. When we understand the grace and the mercy of the gospel, when we comprehend the magnitude of his love, that's the moment when you understand, you won't feel like and, and buy the lie that I just have to obey because that's what just God tells me to do. He, of course he does command us to obey, but it's much more than a duty. 
It becomes a delight when we understand what's on the other side of the door. We'll give ourselves to obedience. We'll give ourselves to walking in his word. When we understand what's around the corner. Joy forevermore in the love of Christ. That's what Jesus is saying here. And that is the accurate teaching that we not only need to believe as the church, but that we need to teach and help others understand about the role of obedience in the Christian life. But the question as we come to our fourth and final point is, can you lose the joy? Can you surrender it? Jesus implicitly states in our text that you can by not keeping his commandments. To keep his commandments is to be thrusted into joy, to not keep his commandments, to disobey, to resist God in our thought life, in our words, in our actions, robs us entirely. But how do you know? How do you know if you're in that position? You can't walk away and and leave our time together without assessing your life and asking yourself the question, am I in that boat? Am I someone who, if I can look back on in the past, had that joy? But now as I look at my life, it's empty. It's void. I'm missing that. What Jesus is talking about. I'm sad. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. According to the word of our Lord, there's a good indication that those symptoms is directly related to sin in your life that you have yet to confess and truly repent of. Earlier, I quoted from Steve Lawson when he said, one of the most infamous lies of the devil is that a life lived, sold out for the glory of Christ is a miserable life. Let me extend to you another quote that is a lie as well, an infamous lie from the devil. Quote, A life lived that is sold out for sin is a pleasurable and joy filled life. That's one thing that Satan would love to convince believers of. It's something he's already convinced non-believers of as in our spiritual death, Paul says in Ephesians two, we were dead in our sin according to the course of this world under the prince of the power of the air but Satan would love to convince and um, persuade believers that life lived in their sin is far more enjoyable than life lived under the commands of Christ. I mean, doesn't Hebrews 11, 25 say sin is pleasurable for a season. We can't forget that part of it as well. Sin in the end will disappoint. David himself says in Psalm 32 verse three, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. We are furthest from God when we are at the same time at our driest and lowest state. But if you find yourself in that position now, according to our Lord, there's sin that needs to be dealt with today. There's sin that we need to get serious about naming, claiming that's in my life and killing, killing sin as John Owen would say, so that sin does not kill you. There's an important figure within the narrative here that serves as a crucial case study. And that is Judas Iscariot. Just a few verses ahead of our passage in John chapter 15, verse six, 
Jesus makes a negative promise, a consequence for those who profess to believe in Christ, but who turn and leave him. Notice verse six of John chapter 15. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Jesus is saying those who don't abide, you could be someone who professes to believe in Jesus like Judas. You could follow him for a time and have seasons of your life where you're fired up about Christianity. You're attending church. But then the time comes where you leave him and you walk away. Jesus says, those are the ones who are headed for destruction. Those who do not abide. That was Judas in this context. Jesus is making a warning to his disciples about the consequences of not abiding. I think here he's talking about Judas. I think he's helping them understand that although Judas would betray Jesus as the story progresses, Judas was also betrayed. He was betrayed by his sin. His lust for money. He thought that he could find abundant life and wealth and selling Christ out for 30 pieces of silver. But we know how the story ends, don't we? Judas killed himself because of the guilt, because of the sorrow that sin took him to. It was sin. He strove to find gratification outside of Christ. It led to his demise. And brothers and sisters who are in Christ, may that sober us this morning. And may that cause us to evaluate every nook and cranny of our life and ask ourselves the question, where am I not abiding in my relationship with Christ? What pet sin, what allegiance and loyalty to my lust am I still holding fast to? And may we not only pinpoint that, but take firm and immediate action as Jesus commands us to, to cut it off and to cut it out of our life that the whole body may not be thrown into hell. May we be quick to confess, to repent, to leave counterfeit joy behind and to come full force into what Christ in Christ alone has for us in his incredible and eternal love. Friends here who don't know Christ, David says in Psalm 32 verse one, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is forgiven is covered. For those who are not in Christ, as we learned earlier, you're under the curse of God. You are dead in your sin, but may you be greatly encouraged and motivated to not stay there, but to come all the way to Christ. As David himself says, how blessed, how happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. You want a taste of that joy? that Jesus is talking about trust in Christ and receive all your sin forgiven and debt paid for by the blood of Christ. Come into the lasting pleasure and find yourself truly blessed. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, that is our prayer today. That we would take hold of the kara, the joy that belongs deep down in our heart. That regardless of what life throws at us, we would know that and we would experience 
the kind of peace and contentment and the delight that only comes in you because of your love for us. Father God, we just pray that you would help us be those who will, whose lives are lived in obedience to you. That we wouldn't treat it as something that is um, uh, something that we're not interested in or something that's unimportant. But I pray, Father, that you would reinforce in our hearts why keeping your commands are so important and how it shapes the life that we live now. Thank you, Father, again, for your son and the love and joy we have in him. We pray that you would carry your people through this time of pandemic, through these trials that we're going through. May you use us as light and salt of the world to, to show and, and broadcast to people that even in the midst of the, this troubling time, they can too have joy made full if they come to Christ. May we use that as an evangelistic opportunity to tell people about our Lord of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.